I'm going to tell you that the Lensa has changed my way of thinking. And I hope to explain to you why this is so, and also how you can get very accurate predictions and how you can select the right power for the patient. And before we go into details, you have to understand that in the system of I.O. power calculation, you have different sources of errors. Of course, you have measurement errors, and we usually talk about these as being the largest source of error. But we also have formula errors, especially in the ELP estimation. Now think of the situation after or before the introduction of optical biometry. Since now we have more than 10 years with optical biometry. And as you know, the accuracy of laser biometry is so good that the error is within 20 microns. If you translate this error into the refractive error of the patient, this means less than tenth of a diopter on every patient. Now, as you know, not all patients end up within a tenth of a diopter in your practice. So there must be rooms for improvement. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Because one of the largest sources of error in any formula is actually how you predict the position of the implant after surgery. I'm not going to talk about the difficulties when we deal with post-LASIK cases, but I will take questions afterwards if you like. But you have to realize that all the formulas have one weakness, and that is how they actually calculate the exact position of that implant. Especially so if you have one of the old formulas taking only the K reading and the action length, that's all. And behind the scenes, actually, it's not visible to the user, but behind the curtain, the formula will calculate the effective lens position with a certain algorithm from only the K reading and the actual length. And that gives some problem. Because actually, many of the formulas use a very old concept. If you have the K reading, you have the actual length. And in one way or the other, it's related to the position of the implant. And some of the models that we still use is based on the Furo approach from 1967. So it's not new. And it dates back to the time when we did surgery at another level, I would say. So my message to you is that we can do much better today. And what we can do, actually, we can look at we have another clinical environment today. When we do surgery, we do it very standardized. We have a small incision. We do capsulorexis in a very standardized manner. Even with, with femtosecond cataract surgery, it's going to be even more standardized. So what is left is very little surgical variation. And if you put the lens in the bag in all your patients, it must, have some, it must have something to do with the anatomy of the anterior segment. And I would like to focus on the influence of the anterior chamber depth and the length thickness in the prediction of the position of the implant. Because now we have the lens star machine. And as you know, it measures the actual length by laser, but not only the actual length is measured by laser, also the corneal thickness and the anterior chamber depth and the length thickness and it's very accurate. And also, of course, you have another option. You also measure the pupil, which I like very much because the pupil is coming into, it's a dark horse. In many of the cases, in the post-laser cases, for instance, I don't want to speak about the post-laser cases, but still, it's nice to have. And what is more important is you can also measure post-op where this eye will ends up in the eye, exactly where it is. So it's not guessing anymore we can actually measure where the eye wall ends up in the eye, and we can analyze how it depends on the pre-op measures. And this is the new concept that, I, concept that I want to describe for you, the C constant. The C constant was a new approach to predict the position of the implant from only anterior chamber depth and length thickness by saying that the eye wall ends up 
at a certain fraction of the thickness of the lens. You may say the crystalline lens, the C constant of the crystalline lens is 0.5, right? Because it's the center of the crystalline lens. So if you have another eye well going to position itself in the capsular bag after shrinkage of the bag at a certain position, it might be 0.4 or something. But the very important thing is if you take only the anterior chamber depth and the length thickness, this is a relevant structure that your surgery is going to influence. And by doing so, this concept will work in any type of eye, including post LASIK eyes. I won't talk about post <laughs> And horses. So you can take species for that sake also. It will work in any type of eye. Also long and short eyes. And here you can see the C constant for a given IOL, this is Acrosoft type of IOL, and the C constant was about 0.4. What is very important is that the constant was a true constant over the action length. So it was the same in the short eye and it was the same in the long eye. That's very important. And because it was a very tight spread, you can use the C constant to predict where the eye well ends up in the eye, this is a measured value, and this is a predicted value, and you can see the regression coefficient is the highest that I've ever seen. Now, this is of no use if you cannot use it in a formula. And here you cannot use the thin lens formulas because they only operate with effective lens planes, which, which is not the physical distances in the eye. So you need at least paraxial ray tracing or thick lens formulas. Or you can do better if you use ray tracing. And we can do that today. I want to show you how effective is this new approach as compared to the standard, which is, for instance, with the SRKT. And in this series, I have more than 1,500 lens surgeries. I don't want to talk about post lasik cases right now. And when you do this kind of study, you need to do one thing. You need to optimize your prediction so you're sure you're having the best A constant for this case series. Otherwise, you will test the differences in A constant. That's not what you want. You really want to test what is the performance of the formula so you, see, you concentrate on the spread around a certain mean value. And this is what has been done. On this left slide, you can see the mean error was zero for the whole series, but the spread around the mean was different between the SRKT and our own approach, as you can see. Also in the long eyes, the SRKT formula has a bias, and that's well described, I think. If we sum the spread around the mean up by taking the mean absolute error, and that's a conventional way of expressing the accuracy of your formula. You see that the mean absolute error is higher for the SRKT formula all over the, um, the action length range. And the highest error is reached in the long eyes. Another way of, of putting it, this is again. Now, now I'm including some of the old formulas. We have the SRK1, the SRK2 and also the holiday, and you can see the SRK1 and 2, I don't want any one of you to use these formulas anymore because they are not the state of the art. But what is nice in this figure is actually that our approach using the C constant gives a very nice prediction which is not influenced by the actual length. So, and you also have very nice small errors in the long eyes. When we sum this up and take the mean absolute error and, and compare the different formulas, you can see the SRK1 formula is a very bad formula. There was some improvement with the SRK2 because there was 11% drop in the mean absolute error. There was an 18% drop to the SRKT. Holiday and SRKT is performing almost the same. And then there's a 14% drop to our new approach and even further drop to the last column, which is a little tricky to explain. But if you have the results from the fellow eye, you can actually take that result and use that for the prediction of the next eye. 
And that has been done in this last column. If we know, another way of putting it is that if we know the action length, where the IO ends up in the first eye, and use that for the second eye, we get a better prediction. So what I'm saying is that we can reduce the mean absolute error. That means all your normal cases will be better with this approach. If we count the number of errors more than one diopter, it was reduced by 50% by this approach as compared to the SRKT. You may ask, why does the SRK formula perform so bad? Well, I would say it's blind. It's blind to the variation in the anterior segment because you only measure the K rating and you only measure the actual length. You don't see, you don't measure the anterior chamber depth and the lens thickness. And to show this is the case, I have plotted the error with the SRKT formula against the anterior segment size, as you can see here. And there is a significant correlation, meaning that the SRKT formula is biased. It's biased with the size of the anterior segments. Also, if we group, if we group the uh, predictions, we can see if you have a very uh, small anterior segment size, the significant error was 0.3 something. If a very large anterior segment size is 0.3 plus. So the span here is about 0.6 diopters. That means a lot. Also, if you know there's a bias with anterior segment anatomy, you would say, what about gender? You know female eyes are just a little shorter, shallow anterior chamber depth than longer eyes. And if we compare female eyes with male eyes with the SRKT formula, I found there's a bias. With the SRKT formula, that's green columns, and there's no bias with our approach because we look, we take into account the exact anatomy of that particular eye, whether male or female. So I would say the SRKT formula and other formulas using only the K rating and the actual length as input, they are blind to the variation in the anterior segment anatomy. And therefore, you'll see bias with anterior segment size, gender, and also with age, actually. And I don't want to speak about the post LASIK cases. Just to show, remind you that you can use the fellow eye uh, information, actually. And this was published in ophthalmology last year. If we look at the arrow between the two eyes, and in this slide, I have compared the arrow with the SRK um, two formula, left eye, right eye. And if you see a correlation here, what does it mean? Well, it tells you that the formula is working poorly. This is a bad formula because it doesn't see the variation in the subject if you have a correlation between the right and left eye, right? So you can do that in your own series. If you, ha if you have recorded the, the results from the first eye and the second eye, and if you find there's a correlation, you're using a bad formula. Well, what I'm saying also, there was a small correlation with my own approach because nobody's perfect, but it was much better it, saying it was a less significant correlation than with the SRKT and the SRK2 formula. Why is that? It's because if you know where the IOL ends up in the eye, and you have a very nice correlation between right and left eye in the poster position of the implant. So if you take the position of the implant in the first eye and use it, and I can use that information in my formula, use it for the second eye, you have much better results. If you don't want to do, uh, let's say, the best formula, you can also use your own formula, bad as it may be, and correct it by knowing the bias. And this has been shown in this figure. So even if you have a SRK2 formula, if you correct your predictions in the second eye, you can get a higher accuracy. But of course, you start up with a very bad accuracy. Now, talking about methods to do power calculations, we have different levels of ambition, I would say. We have the thin lens formulas. Now I've been advocating for the thick lens approach, and I would be happy to talk more about ray tracing because I think that's the future. And to show that this is actually the case, we can use ray tracing on pseudophagic eyes. We published this last year, oh no, sorry, this year in the JCRS to show you 
that if we know all the distances in the eye, and if we have the lens star, we can measure the position of the implant. If we know the corneal shape, the exact dimension, thickness, curvature, front and back curvature, if we know the design of the optic, anterior, posterior curvature, refractive index, and all that, also the aspheric, the Q values or the aspheric uh, constant of that lens, you can put it into a ray tracing software and ask a number of questions. You could actually ask, if I know the refraction of the patient, can I back calculate what is the power of the eye in that eye? And that's what we did in this paper. And this is not, nothing new, because you can, you can choose ray tracing software from different sources. So there are different optical engineering, engineering software. You may know the software called CMAX, for instance, where you can export data and import data uh, from our system and analyze for the point spread function. You can analyze what is the image quality at the retinal plane, and you can optimize every optical component if you want. So it's very flexible. But for this article, we wanted to show that you could actually calculate the power of the eye in the eye based on the post-op refraction and based on the biometry of that eye. And in this series, we had the Acrosoft spheric type of IOL. That's not easy because then you have spherical aberration. You need to do ray tracing. But the point is, this was very successful because even though you might have a minus power IOL or a very high power IOL, the correlation was so nice, I couldn't believe my own eyes. This is coming out very nicely, I think. So the conclusion, and also the error in this prediction was not biased with the IOL power. So it doesn't mean if we have a high-powered IOL or a low-powered. It doesn't mean whether we have a long eye or a short eye. So the conclusion is that ray tracing is very efficient to describe the optics of the pseudophagic eye. And in my opinion, there's no need to use A constants or other magic factors which do not belong to physical optics. And I thank you all for your attention. You'll be surprised how accurate this can be with exact measurements of the pre-op patients by the Denstar machine. Thank you very much. Given that Dr. Olson will need to leave shortly, we'd like, rather than have questions at the end, any specific questions that you might have for him, please entertain them now.